It was Winston Churchill who was asked after the Boer War how he felt, and he said it's always exhilarating to be shot at without result. Uh, when you have a guy who's firing away at your arguments and sort of missing at Dan's rate, I have to feel pretty good. I don't feel like I'm missing any fingers or toes. Um, Stephen Hawking. Just say a word about him. Uh, just to give you an idea of the, in a sense, nonsensical arguments to which atheists are reduced. And what's an imaginary number? Dan spoke of an imaginary number. An imaginary number is something like the square root of negative two. Now, Theoretically, it's a concept. I agree. You can do mathematics with the square root of negative two. But if somebody were to ask you, do you have the square root of negative two dollars in your pocket? You would say, no, that's ridiculous. It's a concept, but it has no equivalent in actually existing reality. Stephen Hawking admits that. Dan Barker evidently doesn't. Then, the God of the gaps. Basically, here's what's going on here. There are unexplained features in the universe. I'm saying the best, best explanation is God. Dan's saying he has no idea what the explanation is, but he's assuming it's not God. And he thinks that's an argument. In other words, here we have a universe. It got here. It must have gotten here somehow. It's fine-tuned for life. Someone or something, it got fine-tuned in some way. Dan has no idea how it happened. Now, if we were going and looking on another planet, uh, looking for life. And let's say we were to find buildings, uh, columns, uh, books, uh, artifacts. What would we conclude? We'd say, well, right away, the evidence points to intelligent life on this planet. Somebody did this. It didn't happen by chance. Molecules didn't just fly together and produce these buildings. Someone did it. We may not know who did it, but someone did it. That's a reasonable explanation. Along comes Dan and goes, well, since we don't know who did it, it's a gap. And we can't really say that someone did it. We just don't know. You can't resort to the good old aliens of the gaps. But we would say, of course we can. We have signs of intelligence, and all we are doing is legitimately inferring that some intelligent being did this. We call that being God. That's all that the argument calls for. It's the best explanation available to us now. Maybe Dan will have some new facts in 20 years and come back and present them. But as of now, he has none. What's interesting about this business of gaps, I should tell you, is that for the atheist, a gap is a nuisance. The atheist goes, well, you know, there's this little gap. We scientists haven't figured it out yet. Tomorrow we'll have an answer, or next week, or next year. This is a very unscientific way to argue. Why? Because true scientists love gaps. For a true scientist, a gap is a clue that there may be some defect in our inherent understanding of reality. You know, when, uh, when we had the Newtonian universe 200 years ago, it explained very well the motions of the planets. But there was one planet, Mercury, whose orbit was slightly off. Newton couldn't predict it. It was a few degrees of angle off, a gap. Now, a lot of scientists with Dan's mentality said, no big deal. It's just a little gap. Maybe there's some matter we haven't found or something. But Einstein recognized, wait a minute. Newton's theory, this gap means that Newton's theory is in a way wrong. And when Einstein came up with his theory of relativity, he went back and re-measured the orbital precession of Mercury, and he found, wow, my theory explains it, the gap is closed. It doesn't mean that there was just a little bit of manure to put into the hole. Newton's entire conception of space and time was in fact inadequate. You needed a deeper understanding of reality to explain the orbital motions of Mercury. So my point is that what atheism do is doing now is you can say a form of science worship and if there are things that can't be explained, the atheist has a lot of confidence, the brilliant scientists will figure it out tomorrow, whereas in reality, the really brilliant scientists are trying to use the gap to come up with a deeper comprehension of reality. So my point is that this God of the gaps argument is a very unscientific mode of thinking, no less unscientific than the argument it tries to, it tries to dispute. I'll say a word about the resurrection. You notice that Dan was rebutting arguments that I never made. He said, well, we don't know that there were 500 witnesses. I never mentioned 500 witnesses. I simply said that groups of disciples on multiple occasions claim to have seen the risen Christ. That's a fact. They claim to have seen the risen Christ. There might be a better explanation. They were dreaming. They were hallucinating. They were lying. But you can't just say that they didn't claim to do it. If you do that, you're writing off all of ancient history. I mean, you could say, well, how do we know that Socrates existed? 
After all, it was only Plato and Xenophon and Aristophanes who mentioned him. The documents referring to Socrates often came after his death, so we're not going to believe a word of it. My point is Dan is a music pastor. He's not a historian. If you apply the standards of history using his method, all of ancient history would have to be written off. We would not believe anything we read. We wouldn't believe that Caesar crossed the Rubicon. We wouldn't believe that Alexander the Great conquered Egypt. We wouldn't believe that Socrates walked the streets of Athens. Essentially, ancient history would be reduced to complete nonsense. Thank you very much. All right, we're going to take about 10 minutes where you guys get to ask each other questions. Um, Obviously, you know, you don't want to take the entire 10 minutes to answer it, so we get a couple questions back and forth. But uh, Dinesh, why don't you go ahead and ask uh, Dan from either some of the statements you made or from something else you'd like to introduce a question. Oh, Dan, uh, maybe we'll, perhaps we'll do this, but I'll ask you a question. You answered, you asked me a question. Is that okay as a format? Sounds like a plan. Okay. You mentioned that scientists uh, are able to explain the peculiar features of our universe by, ref by, uh, by, by positing multiple universes. Can you state one piece of empirical evidence that there is even one universe other than our own? Well, we know it's greater than zero, and we know it's at least one. By what principle would that number be limited to only one? We do know that that minimal Planck distance, which is very tiny, that, that prohibits the universe from becoming a singularity, we do know that that means that that was not the beginning. There was a time before that Planck time. We do know that. We do also know that space and time itself did not come into existence at that point because there was no singularity. Therefore, cosmologists are not saying, yes, there was a multiverse. What they're saying is the, the hypothesis of a multiverse, and by the way, there are four different kinds of potential multiverses, the hypothesis of it, just like the 101 prisoners who were getting shot at, right, uh, explains a lot. Uh, if, in fact, uh, the cosmos, now, now cosmologists are using the word cosmos rather than universe. They use the word universe more in the local sense of our own Big Bang, that our own Big Bang is just one of many billions or trillions of bubbles in a champagne glass, let's say, and there are different formulations of that, and that most of them are stillborn. Most of them are obviously not going to have any constants, but it would be a true miracle if some of them did not have the constants tuned right. It would be a true miracle if one of those 101 prisoners did not survive the 100 bullets. So, Dan, I asked you if there's any empirical evidence for another universe. I take it your answer is no, because you come back with 101 prisoners, and you say we do know, but then you state things. You, do you know what came before the Big Bang? Well, then let me ask you. No, I'm not, well, answer my question. You don't know. No one knows. Yes, but we do know that there was a before. We do you, know that that, that that Planck minimum was in a quantum state of uncertainty existing already in some state. And it is perfectly sensible to think that if that happened and that's, that, you know, it, where did that come from, that it was a part of an infinite series perhaps or, or whatever. But in the same sense, I would ask you, did, did Thor exist? That was a big gap in their understanding. They didn't, did, do you think Thor actually existed? No. Well, then that gap is closed and you've got, but at the time that they came up with Thor, that made sense to them, didn't it? They plugged that gap with their idea. You right. now, are, are you now telling us that science has come to an end? We will never have any more answers to these questions in spite of the history of the success of science in closing these gaps repeatedly? No, uh, no, but I, I'm, of course not, look. Aristotle thought that our mental work was not done in the brain, but in the heart. So he was wrong about that. There have been a lot of mistakes in the past. Science does develop. I'm not objecting to the, pro uh, progr the progress of science. I'm objecting to you using what can be called the atheism of the gaps, which is to say when you come across something that's unexplained, you assume ultimately an atheist uh, explanation for it. No, you, no. Said, you said we do know what came before the Big Bang. And I think that that statement, in a way, shows, shows how wrong you are about this whole thing, because before the Big Bang, there was no before. If space and time are properties of our universe, the term before only applies to our universe. There was no before, Dan. Exactly, except our universe that we live in is only one of potentially many. So when you talk about the universe, we're using, in the last 30 or 40 years, 
philosophers and scientists have changed their usage of the word universe. They now use cosmos for the entire realm of existence. The one universe that you're talking about, the one we happen to inhabit from the Big Bang that we came from, actually goes back to a point that was not a singularity. It goes back to a point where there was already quantum potential sitting there. Just as you know that matter comes out of empty space, the beginning of our universe, we don't know what was before, but we, we do know that it is perfectly consistent to assume that that state had a pre-existing, it was not the beginning of space and time in the cosmos, it was the beginning of space and time in our local universe. So but Dan, you're confusing universe and cosmos. The cosmos is in, indeed eternal. Well, you began by saying it is one universe of many. You state it as a fact. Now, here in your book, Godless, you, you say that you are a, a man of reason. You say that you don't adopt positions in the absence of evidence. I say that I try. You try. Well, you're yeah. failing right now because, because at the end of your own statement, you said the words, it is consistent to assume. Consistent to assume means we don't know but we're just guessing, and it may work out this way, but you started out saying you do know. So here's my point. I didn't say my I do know. My point is, you're accusing me of making, uh, having positions based on faith and not adopting evidence. I've tried to stay within the parameters of evidence. I haven't appealed to scripture or revelation. I've relied on history and philosophy and science, and I think what I'm showing is that you're playing fast and loose with the facts here. I am saying that we don't know. We, we don't you know. Are Thank saying, you. You are saying that we do no. I'm saying that it is a reasonable explanation given fine-tuning to posit a fine-tuner. I asked you if you have a better explanation, so what is it? Well, it's a reasonable explanation to assume that a quantum state at that level had a pre-existing existence, that space and time did not come into existence at that. That's equally reasonable to assume. If you want to round it off to make a, a factual claim that there is a God, then why should I not also round it off? I'm not doing that. I'm saying that science works with these these probabilities and these hypotheses, and some of them will be wrong. All right, Thor, but then. Thor was wrong, and we discarded it. And the God of the Bible is wrong, in my opinion, and we will discard it. It's useless. It doesn't really explain because this immense complexity of the brain of this being out there who created this complexity, where did that come from? Did that, you know, if, if complexity requires a designer, if functional complexity needs to be designed, how do you account for the functional complexity of the mind of this designer that you are positing? You, you've dug a huge all hole right, well, here. Let me answer. Let me answer in two ways. First of all, one of the problems with the quantum is that when you go to the very microscopic level, matter behaves weirdly. And this is called quantum weirdness. And today people use it to explain virtually everything. So we have two theories. In, in, a, in a sense, we have the idea of a creator, or we have the quantum fluctuation. I mean, now imagine if we were, if we were just debating here, for example, whether OJ did it. We're discussing whether OJ did it. And I say, look, uh, there's blood evidence, there's handwriting evidence, there's motive. Uh, and I put all these things together. I say, therefore, it looks like this was planned and executed. Someone carried it out. And then you say, well, actually, I think it was the result of a quantum fluctuation. How plausible would that be when you've given us no idea how such an explanation would work? You're simply pointing ultimately to a theory in science and saying that did it when there are not even most scientists who would even agree with you. But let me answer your question. Basically what Dan is saying is, okay, maybe God did the universe. Maybe some complex mind created the world. But who created that complex mind? That's really his question and I'm going to answer it. I think that that question is irrelevant to our investigation. And I come back to an analogy I gave a little earlier about us searching for life on other planets. And let's say we are on the planet on Saturn or Jupiter, and we discover that there are all kinds of artifacts and monuments and books and so on. So we say, we conclude that there are intelligent beings on this planet. They must have done this. Now along comes Dan and goes, well, that's a ridiculous explanation. Who created those intelligent beings? And the answer is, who cares? I don't know who created the intelligent being. I'm simply trying to prove that the existence of intelligent artifacts and intelligent life shows that there must be intelligent beings who did this. Who caused them is a matter for a separate investigation. So the fact that we don't know who created the aliens doesn't mean that the aliens didn't do that. And that's the point I'm trying to make here. The fine-tuning of the universe suggests a fine-tuner we may be able to say very little about who that fine tuner is or whether someone else created him. Let's leave that aside. At this point, I'm simply saying the universe was fine tuned, a fine tuner did it, I'm calling that fine tuner God. 
That is a tight argument within its own ambit. And Dan, you've done nothing to challenge that. Well, let me tear it apart here. It's, you're basically begging the question logically, because think about what you're doing. Your argument says that the reason there is a God is because we need to explain this complexity. We need to explain the fine-tuning, right? You were, you were, your premise is, with, that, with or without a God, your premise is we have complexity, we have fine-tuning, we have this, this explanation, and therefore, there, it, must, it must have been created by further complexity, right? And then, within that statement, you're saying, except let's exclude God, because we, you're bringing God into your premise. It's called begging the question. You're saying everything, everything in the universe except God needs, needs an explanation. Everything in the universe, all complexity in the universe except God needs an explanation. You are accepting God. You are bringing him circular reasoning, and that's bad argument. That's bad logic. What, what a true logician would say is we need to back off from that premise and not have an answer and wait for an answer rather than plug it with your God of the gaps. Well, I mean, we're waiting, and when as new information becomes available, we'll take it into account. But here's my point. My point is that the inference to the best explanation is based on what we do know. So, for example, if, I, if I'm walking down a street and I look down an alley and I see a head rolling in the alley, right? I, I know it didn't just get there automatically. Somebody committed suicide and chopped off their own head or someone did it. We require some explanation, right? So here we have a universe and we know it requires explanation. I'm positing an explanation that would account for the intelligent design of the universe. Now, you're saying, how do we account for that being that did that? But see, we know about the universe. We know nothing about that being. If we know, for example, that aliens produced monuments on Jupiter, we still can say nothing about aliens. We have no idea. Do they have ten eyes? Do they uh, communicate telepathically? We have no idea what those aliens would be like. Are we so, therefore, so therefore, it does not beg the question, it does not beg the question to say, intelligent life did this, but we are unable to account for that intelligent life itself. That's not a begging of the question. That is outside the orbit of our experience and we know nothing about it. We are now accounting for something that is within our experience and we're reasonably entitled to infer to an explanation. Uh, Dinesh went over 26 seconds on his rebuttal. Could I take just a 10 seconds here? You are, you are positing the explanation of complexity by more complexity. How do we explain complexity? Well, we explain it with more complexity. That's what you're saying. You're explaining one mystery with another mystery, and so you haven't answered your question. You're simply assuming the very thing you're trying to explain. Very good. Very good. Now we'll hear from the audience because they have some questions. Um, some of them obviously stay within what you've already uh, presented. Some of them, because you've presented something, obviously somebody's thought, wow, they need to explain that, and it goes beyond a little bit uh, sometimes of the purview of what uh, the debate's about. Um, but Dinesh, we're going to start with a question for you. And uh, somebody was very interested uh, in really something that, uh, that Dan brought up. Um, they said, how do you reconcile a belief in evolution, interspecies evolution, with the creation account in Genesis? The question is about evolution and Genesis. And in a way, uh, when Dan stated my view of this, he, he ran a little bit roughshod over it. There's an important distinction we have to make here, a distinction between evolution as a scientific notion, a scientific idea, a scientific theory, and what can be called metaphysical Darwinism. Now, Darwin was actually both. He was a scientist, and he also, toward the end of his life, became an atheist. He, he never called himself an atheist. Uh, he said agnostic, but he was essentially very, he became very anti-Christian. Why did Darwin become anti-Christian? It had nothing to do with evolution. Darwin became very angry at God because one of his children, his young daughter Annie at the age of 10, became sick and died. And Darwin said, from that point I decided, almost as a form of revenge against God, uh, to reject the Christian God. There were, uh, now, evolution uh, is an explanation. It's not an explanation of life. Many people think evolution explains how life got started. Wrong. Evolution assumes life. Evolution assumes self-replicating cells. A self-replicating cell has all the built-in complexity of a computer. Darwin didn't even try to account for that. He said, I'm assuming that. I'm going to try to show you how we go from life form A to life form B. Now, when Darwin published his Origin of Species, a Harvard biologist, Asa Gray, who was a devout Christian, wrote to Darwin and said, you know, ever since I've been reading in all the years I've been reading the Bible, it tells me that God made the universe and it, God made life. 
But the Bible doesn't say how. Your theory of evolution offers a very good explanation of how this may have all come to pass. And Darwin was thrilled. He actually took Asa Gray's letter and would publish it in subsequent uh, um, editions of The Origin of Species. So here's the bottom line. Evolution by itself is not a threat to Christianity or to Genesis. However, Darwinian metaphysical Darwinism, the idea that this is all an unguided process that doesn't need a creator, that somehow evolution will magically one day account for the origin of life, this is all metaphysical Darwinism. It's essentially atheism that has been injected into evolution. I completely reject that. Can I respond to that? Um, if you'd like to, for a minute. You write in your book, uh, it seems improbable that the small group of intelligent design advocates is right and the entire community of biologists is wrong. You write in here with admiration of that group of Jews who consider the story of Adam and Eve to be a parable and a metaphor, that Adam and Eve actually did not exist as historical people. I applaud you for that. That's good liberal thinking. That's good. Adam and Eve did not exist. Otherwise, that, you know, who were the first human beings? It was, as, it was like when Jesus told the parable of the prodigal son, that wasn't really a person, and Adam and Eve were not really people either, and that's, I think, how you and I both see the Genesis story as a, a, an attempt by primitive people to try to make a fable. And by the way, look up the word fable in the dictionary. It's a moral tale that involves a talking animal. They invented this fable to try to give some meaning, but Adam and Eve did not exist historically. And I think you agree with me. Well, let me answer that, because the word Adam means the original man. So in that sense, you can say, was his name Adam? We're calling him Adam. He was the original man. And what do we mean by the original man? By the original man, we mean biblical man, moral man, man who's capable of reasoning. Now, here's a question that we don't know. Were there any other beings on the planet before Adam and Eve or while Adam and Eve were alive? The Bible leaves this question open. Why? Because Adam and Eve had two children, Cain and Abel. Cain killed Abel and then moved to another country. Was he alone? He obviously married and had children. Whom did he marry? Eve, his mom? So the point is, the Bible leaves open the question of whether or not there might have been other creatures on earth, even though Adam and Eve, in a sense, were the first, in a sense, they are the first man and woman to be biblical, which is to say to be able to reason between good and evil. So this is not a rejection of the literal account of Genesis. It's an attempt to try to interpret it in an intelligent way. Here's the thing we should remember as Christians. The Bible is inerrant, meaning free of mistakes, but we're not. Our interpretations of the Bible are not infallible. And therefore, we are trying as intelligent Christians to make sense of things and to understand them better. What Dan is doing really here is trying to exploit thoughtful ambiguity and make it seem like a rejection of Scripture. It's not. It's an affirmation of Scripture. It's loving God not just with our heart, but with our mind. And that's what Christians should do. Very good. Dan, one of the best questions we actually got was from an eighth grader um, here at PCA, but Dinesh already asked you about that one. So I'm going to go on to this one. It says, you say that the cosmos is eternal, which would mean that it is infinite, yet it has been proven mathematically that an infinite is impossible. What do you say to Hilbert's Hotel? Well, if that's true, if an actual infinity does not exist in reality, then God, who is supposedly actually infinite, cannot exist in reality, right? If it's, if it's sauce for the goose, it's sauce for the gander. If you cannot have an actual infinity, and when you think about it, it does kind of make sense, because what was God's first thought? You know, didn't he have a sort of temporal antecedence to his thoughts all back through infinity? There are different kinds of infinities, and there are infinities that you would call not linear infinities, like a chain of events that goes back forever, but there are also what you would call uh, bounded infinities, which our current universe is a bounded infinity. If you were to go in a straight line, straight up from here, just straight, not, not varying at all, what would happen according to Einstein? Do you know what would happen? You'd come back up through your feet. It's a bounded four-dimensional infinity. So yes, the cosmos can be conceived of as infinitely existing in time itself, and Hawking, to his credit, is trying to explain how time could not be a straight line. He conceives of it as two-dimensional time, imaginary time, not, in that it's, not that it actually is a thing that exists, but if time does go sideways, just like, like a dimension of a big beach ball, you can go in any direction and come up to whatever point, you can have a cosmos that is 
a bounded infinity, and perhaps if there's a God, then his infinity is also a bounded infinity. If I can answer briefly, there's, there's no question that there can be immaterial infinities. I'll give you one right now. The sequence of numbers, one, two, three, four, five. Keep counting, and you can go on forever. There's no place you have to stop. If you're talking about something immaterial, like numerical values, we know that can be an infinity. So if God is immaterial, as the Christian God is taken to be immaterial, not having a body, there's absolutely no intellectual or conceptual problem with an immaterial being being infinite. The problem is we don't know of any material infinities. If somebody says, here is a seashore and it stretches for miles and the number of grains of sand on it is infinite, the answer is, sorry, pal, it's a lot, but it's probably not infinite. So the question was a very good one. Are there material infinities? And the answer is, we're not sure, probably not, but it's no problem with the idea of God being infinite. All right, here's a question um, that I'm going to assume that neither of you have ever gotten, so we'll try it out. Um, it actually goes for both of you. So, uh, Dinesh, uh, what is the best evidence or argument for atheism? And then Dan, I guess the opposing question would be, what is the best argument um, or uh, evidence uh, for theism or Christianity? So kind of put you in each other's shoes for a minute. The best argument for atheism, in my view, is, is one that Dan alluded to but did not develop, which is the, uh, the prevalence of suffering and evil in the world. Uh, and the best argument for atheism is that God is powerful, God is good, so why then do we have as much suffering as we do? Why does a five-year-old kid get cancer? Doesn't God have the power to stop him? Uh, if he does, why doesn't he? Um, now, I do want to point out, by the way, Dan cited this as an example of how he became an atheist. To me, this is not an argument about God's existence. Uh, and here's why. Imagine if I uh, trusted my dad, and I thought him to be a great guy, very powerful, has all kinds of influence, a really good guy, loves me very much. And then I'm in a desperate situation. I really need help. I turn to my dad. Dad, help me. And he won't do it. For whatever reason, he won't do it. Do I conclude, well, therefore my dad does not exist? This would be idiotic. Obviously, my dad exists. I may change my opinion of my dad. I may go, why doesn't he help me? What's wrong with him? In other words, my point is I may have doubts about the character of my dad, but not about his existence. So to me, the problem of suffering is fallaciously advanced as an argument against the existence of God, but for a lot of people, a lot of people lose their faith or reject their faith because they claim to object to the character of God. I, th I think you're right. Uh, the problem of evil is not an argument against any particular God existing. It's an argument against the existence of a good God. Uh, the, the Christian God is defined as a good God, benevolent God. Therefore, the problem of evil is a real thorn to those who think God is a good God. There might be an indifferent God or there might be a, a cruel God, in which, in which case that argument disappears. There are no really, really good arguments for theism or for Christianity, but if I had to pick the best for Christianity, it would be history. I would give the historical evidence for Jesus about maybe 10 or 20 percent probability. It's there. We have a book. We have a Bible. We have documents. We can read them. And by the way, Dinesh is wrong when he claims that the hallucination theory is the main theory among the critics of the resurrection. It is not the main theory. I know Robert Price talks about that as one potential. The main hypothesis is not the hallucination theory, but the legend theory. And I write about that in great detail in my book, legend slash and or myth and it could be both. Jesus may not have even existed, but even if he did exist, the New Testament story shows footprints of legendary embellishment. It was cut from the same fabric as other ancient mythologies. Even the second century Christian apologist, uh, Justin Martyr, when he was arguing with the pagans, he said, why do you pagans resist Christianity? You have virgin births, you have ascensions into heaven, you have all these miracles and healings, and so there's nothing different. Justin Martyr told the pagans, there's nothing different in, in between paganism and Christianity. Christianity was cut from that fabric. So, but we do have documents, and we should look at those documents and analyze them, as you say, intelligently. We should look at them with our minds and see what they say. And when you do look closely at the historical evidence for Christianity, you have to give it some credibility. But 
all history is a matter of probabilities. In fact, all science is probabilities. History being the weakest of the legitimate sciences gives us the least amount of confidence even that Socrates existed, for example. We don't know 100% for sure, but where our, when it comes to historical confidence for the New Testament, maybe it goes to 10, 10 or 20%. But the trouble is that people like you take that low probability and round it off to factuality, when in fact there are many other explanations, which I do go into in greater detail uh, in a section of my book, that show that the, uh, it, the story can be explained in purely naturalistic terms. May I briefly, I mean, it seems to me, Dan, that just doesn't make sense of the facts. Look, I, I might say I'll make up a legend and go tell my friends because that'll make me powerful, they'll listen to me, and so on. But then when a Roman soldier grabs me and sticks me into the Colosseum and puts in a friendly lion uh, and says, Dinesh, uh, will you admit it? You made this stuff up. I'm going to say, yeah, it was pretty good while it lasted. Uh, I made it up. I admit it. I'm not going to go to my death, as many of the early Christians did, for something that I knew to be a lie. But all religions have their martyrs. Buddhists set themselves on fire. Muslims are martyrs. But for that's the faith. a fallacy because they're setting themselves on fire in anticipation of a future event that may or may not come to pass. The 9 11 terrorists might have expected the 72 virgins, and now they're being attended by some hairy guys with tattoos. They were wrong. <laughs> they're guessing about the future. But in any event, they did not back off from their fervently held beliefs. It happens in all religions, and if you believe something, there, there are parents right now today, there are Christian mothers and fathers who allow their children to die as a test of their faith. There was a couple in Wisconsin that were just convicted. The little girl died of easily treatable diabetes on Easter Sunday, screaming, and yet they would not take her to the doctor because the Bible says the prayer of faith will heal the sick. That girl is dead, and those parents are unrepentant because their faith led them to murder their own daughter. And many, peop many people, when they get attracted to a faith, if, it, if, the, if the Jesus story did happen, it's no big surprise. Look at, look at how Mormons became martyrs for their faith, and yet you don't believe the angel Moroni and the hill Cumorah and the little magic stones and all that stuff. People latch onto a religious system, and some of them, at this end of the bell curve of mental health, some of them become martyrs for any faith in the world. Right, but you're confusing what happens once a faith is developed within the faith from the origin of faith. In other words, think about it. The early Christians had to convince a substantial portion of the Roman Empire had already converted to Christianity before Constantine. These were very, in other words, Christianity had spread widely prior to the Roman emperor converting, and then eventually it had to be promoted worldwide. So here's my point. My point is it defies historical explanation to take an event that is an historical event. There was an early church. There were early Christians. They did face persecution. H try to explain those facts without saying that something happened, to say that there wasn't even a Jesus, that someone just made him up, defies explanation. Something did happen, and there may have been a Jesus. There were many self-proclaimed messiahs in the first, cent second, first century B.C. There was a Judas the Christ, a Theodos the Christ. There was this Apollonius guy. There was an Egyptian Jew messiah. There may have been a Yeshua the Christ, a Jew who has started this movement, who died. But that might have happened, but the legendary development afterwards, the New Testament itself is a big cartoon story based maybe on a real person, uh, skeptics aren't in agreement about whether it was total myth or just part myth and part legend. So yes, you can have people dying for a belief in something that he, that he was seen, that he's, you know, Elvis was seen, you know, or that Jesus was seen from the dead. People would believe that and they would give their lives for it. It happens. I haven't seen anyone dying for Elvis. People swooned for Elvis. But, uh, Speak. <laughs> but that was a real Elvis. <laughs> Go ahead. Speak, speaking of death. Uh, and Dan, this is primarily to you, uh, but Dinesh has just written a book about it, so I'm sure he'll respond to it. Um, but if you believe only in the material and not the supernatural, what do you believe happens when you die? Death is death. What do you mean? What happens when you die? When you die, you die. The organism decays, you fall apart, and you're not here anymore. Before I was born, there was a huge amount of time, perhaps an eternity, during which I did not exist. Didn't bother me one bit. After I'm dead, the same will be true. That's what death means. There is no evidence. Even Einstein said it's in inconceivable that there's any evidence that somehow this spirit, whatever that is, and maybe Dinesh can define what a spirit is, an immaterial being. What in the world is an immaterial being? Uh, there's no evidence that there's any survival of, of, of 
our consciousness and our personality. When you turn off the computer, the software is gone. When this brain dies and decays, look what happens with Alzheimer's. And look what happens with our body when it falls apart. Death is death. The important thing to us atheists who know that we're going to die, it makes life more precious. If life is eternal, then life is cheap. We put more value on things that are rare and precious, right? So that we know that this might be my last moment and I'm going to enjoy it. I'm going to live it. I'm going to, I'm going to exult in the beauty of all of this and, and some of the ugliness as well. So when you die, you die. You're dead, you're dead. And, you know, sure, we'd like to extend our life. But even Woody Allen said, if there's, a, if there's an eternal life, when does it end, you know? He also said, I don't believe in life after death, but just in case I'm taking a change of underwear, um, that whole idea that we want to live on is sort of a selfish thing. We'd live on in the memories of those who remain, and we live on in the lingering deeds of the actions we have done on this earth. That's how we live on. We do not live on in any immaterial, soul, spiritual way. That is just a myth. That is a lie. That is wishful thinking. And if you're basing your life on that, you're wasting precious time of the real life that we have as biological animals in this natural environment. Truth of it is, if you set aside Jesus Christ, no one knows what comes after death. So it's very interesting that you here have Dan, a champion of reason, who has to admit that he has no idea what comes after death, just as the caterpillar has no idea it's going to become a butterfly. And yet Dan states as a factual matter, it's a myth, it's a lie. Why would somebody be so passionate about something that they have absolutely no information about? I would suggest that Dan is taking a faith-based rejection of life after death. In other words, Dan doesn't want there to be a life after death. Why? And we forget this. He keeps telling us believers want to live forever. Atheists don't want to live forever. Why? Because nobody wants to be judged for their actions. If there is a death, there may well be a last judgment. Or, or, or even in other religions, there's cosmic justice. So there's, in a way, for many people, a desire to avoid moral accountability. And therefore, they will profess as fact something that they do not know to be a fact. In reality, there's actually some powerful indications that there is life after death. I go in, into these in, in a recent book of mine. I'm not going to belabor the arguments now. The little empirical evidence we do have and that is these near-death experiences, people who are not dead, but very close to death. They have cardiac arrest, their brain has stopped showing any signs of activity, and yet they report experience. They're conscious, they say they are pulled through a tunnel, they see a bright light, they feel their life come before them, they encounter deceased relatives and friends, they are in the presence of a celestial being. There are thousands of these near-death experiences reported all over the world. They're taking place right now, and if they are true, if all these people aren't conspiring and all lying, and frankly, no one thinks they are, the truth of it is that shows that consciousness and experience can survive the breakdown of your bodily functions. That's empirical evidence. The atheists have no evidence. They don't want there to be life after death, so it's only wishful thinking on their part that there should be no last judgment and no life after death. At the very least, I wish they'd just step back and say they don't have a clue. I would like there to be life after death. I never said that. I think it would be fascinating if that were true, to extend our lives. I think so why do you say it's a lie when you have no idea one way or the other? Because what does death mean, right? You mean the death of the body. Your evidence is not evidence for life after death. It's a near death experience. You haven't crossed any line with these near-death experiences. They're, they're evidence for something going on in our mind. In fact, do you know that these same chemicals that are released to the brain when people are dying, these opioids and endorphins, have been administered to people who are not dead, and under the experience of these opioids, they had near-death experiences. The brain hallucinates, and when the brain goes, it's fighting to live, and it does hallucinate in all these ways and has these Interesting, fast, even atheists will have near-death experiences and not think it's Jesus. A, a Muslim will see Allah, right? A, um, a, a Christian will see Jesus. And atheists, who knows? We see a blank piece of paper, I suppose. But the, um, what you just gave us is not evidence for life after death. It's for evidence for how the brain functions near death. And, you know, if there's a life after and if there's a judgment, if there's a God, I'm not fighting that. I'm not afraid of moral restrictions. I'm not afraid of being judged. You know, if I'm going to be judged, fine, I'll own up to my judgment. I don't want somebody else paying the death penalty for my actions. 
We atheists are, are responsible and mature about this. And in spite of the fact that I might wish to live forever, I'm going to stick with what we do know. And we do not know at this point, beyond what some holy book tells us, that there's any life after death. Well, you say that there is a prevailing theory, which I discussed at some length. It's called the dying brain hypothesis. And that is it tries to explain the near-death experiences by saying that when your brain is dying, it goes into shutdown mode. And it has these experiences of a tunnel, a bright light, but it's just special effects generated by the dying brain. There's one serious problem with this hypothesis that has never been answered. There are tens of thousands of people who have had near-death experiences. Where are they now? Answer, they're walking around. They're going to work. They have families. They drive cars. So if their brains have died, the dying brain in the process of shutting down has generated the near-death experience. How has their brain reversed the entire process, uh, evidently healed itself, so it's now functioning completely normally? It would be sort of like saying, I've turned off the car, I've taken the key out, and the car is still running. So the truth of it is these near-death experiences cannot be so easily dismissed. Dan is trying to dismiss, dismiss them by saying, look, the only evidence I'll accept is if a dead guy gets out of the coffin, shows up at his funeral, and gives the, gives the tribute to himself. True, we don't have that kind of evidence. The near-death experience is the closest people come to death. Many of these people are clinically dead. They should not be having experience, and yet they do. So what gets me is the atheists are always asking for facts. Give us experience. Don't cite the Bible. Don't give us legends. Give us actual empirical evidence. Here I put 10,000 cases on the table, and Dan goes, well, haven't convinced me yet. What's he waiting for? We're going to finish up with final um, closing arguments. And uh, Dan, you're going to go ahead and go first. You have five minutes. Thanks. In the New Testament, Jesus gave a lot of advice. Some of it was good. Most of it was not. Most of the moral advice that Jesus gave, such as showing how compassionate he was by advising that some of your slaves should not be beat as hard as others, and never denouncing slavery, saying things that, such as uh, marrying a divorced woman is adultery, are there any people here who have married a divorced woman? You're, according to Jesus, you're committing adultery. Talking about cutting off body parts and gouging out eyes. Preaching hell, almost with glee. Uh, weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. Uh, giving useless, counterproductive advice such as don't plan for the future. Take no thought for the morrow. If you lose a lawsuit, pay double what you have lost. If any man asks you for anything, give it to them without exception. And so on. But he did say some good things. The golden rule is not bad. Of course, it's not unique to Christianity. Confucius, half a millennium before Christianity, said it in a better way. That which you find harmful to yourself, don't do to others, which is much better than the do unto others formulation that we hear within Christianity. I wouldn't call it a golden rule. I might think it's a bronze rule, perhaps. It was Oscar Wilde, I think, who said, the problem with do unto others is what if you have bad taste? But there's one thing that Jesus said that I do admire. If Jesus existed, and he may have, but I doubt it. If he existed, and if he said the things that the writers of the New Testament said that he said, which I doubt, but let's just take it as a literary statement. Jesus said that they who are healthy, they who are whole, don't go to the doctor. Only they who are sick. He was talking, of course, about the Christian system, which is a salvation system. Christians might say, well, we are no different from the rest of the world. We can admit it, but we are saved and they aren't, which is what I used to preach. Yeah, Christians really aren't any better. Christians are not more moral or more, more kind, more giving. Of course, every group has its saints and its sinners. But those of us who are outside the Christian system and that I used to be within, we don't see ourselves as sick Salvation is a religious cure to a religious problem. The Bible creates this problem of whatever you want to call it, original sin, as in Adam all die, so in Christ shall all be made alive. And then it purports to solve this problem that it created. You are all sick. You're all bad. You're going to be judged. You're all deserving of hell. How many children have gone to bed at night fearful that they might die and go to hell? What a horrible doctrine to teach children. It's almost a form of child abuse. 
How much respect would you have for a doctor who runs around cutting people with a knife in order to sell them a Band-Aid? Well, that's what Christianity is. Christianity's got it all wrong. It's telling you that you're bad. You're horrible. You're just not a good person. Of course, there is a violent tendency within our species, but there's also a naturally evolved, instinctive, altruistic tendency. We are naturally good people. When someone commits a horrible deed, what do you say? That was an inhuman thing to do. We assume that the basic human thing to do is good. We who are outside the Christian system, we don't assume the worst about human nature. In fact, assuming the worst can be a self-fulfilling prophecy. You can think, oh, I'm a horrible sinner. I need to confess to Jesus. But we think that since salvation is a phony solution to a phony problem, we think that if salvation is the cure, then atheism is the prevention. Just don't buy into the sickness. Don't view yourself as sick and needing a savior. I did a debate in Queens, New York with a Muslim opponent, and afterwards I told Ali, I told him, you Muslims, you're so good, kind and good, and they gave me gifts, and they fed me food, and it, it, was, it was just a wonderful experience to meet this Muslim community, and I said, Ali, you people are so nice, and he said, well, Don, Allah commands me to be nice to you. And I'm thinking, oh, I didn't say this, but I'm thinking, oh, you mean you're restraining yourself? You really don't want to be nice to me because God's telling you to? You're being nice to me? The, the, the Abrahamic religion system is totally upside down about human nature. We atheists and agnostics don't view anything wrong with us. Of course, our, our understanding is limited, and that's what drives science. But we think that if you're motivated to be a good person because of the promise of heaven, that shows how little you think of other people, really. Or if you're motivated to be a good person because of the threat of hell, that shows how little you think of yourself. We humanists think that human beings should be good for goodness' sake. If we are merely evolved primates in the world, our job in life is to survive and to reproduce and to benefit ourselves. Why should we be good for goodness sake? There is no goodness built into evolution. We are selfish creatures in the world. If we are good, it means that there is a part of our nature. If we are good to strangers with no benefit to ourselves, that says that there is a part of our humanity that cannot be explained in purely evolutionary terms. I don't really want to waste time rebutting Dan's uh, really absurd portrait of Jesus. Uh, the idea that he took glee in hell. There's absolutely no passage where Jesus takes glee. Jesus is essentially giving you, in a sense, an emergency package for how to avoid this terrible outcome. And... For some reason, the animus against Jesus, I think, itself requires psychological explanation. Because think about it. Wouldn't the world be a better place if everybody followed the teachings of Jesus? If everybody turned the other cheek, was kind and gentle, forgave others for offenses? If you look at Jesus' teachings, never hurt anybody. Even then, it's not enough for Dan. He's able to ransack through the Bible and find Jesus was rude to his mom. Things like that. It suggests to me, in a, in a sense, a bitterness that I think is now become part, very often, not always, of modern atheism. I want to answer his point about sick people, because I think that the case for Christianity depends upon the acknowledgement of the following fact. Things are not as they ought to be. Anybody in this room disagree? I don't see any hands up. I think we'd all agree that we live on two levels. Here's the way things are. Let's call that the human level. And we all know, we can envision, we hope for a better world, perfect justice, perfect beauty, perfect truth. Let's call that the divine level. That's the way things ought to be. So there's a huge chasm between the way things are and the way things ought to be. And how do you bridge this chasm? The atheist goes, that's the wrong diagnosis. We're doing great right now. That's just a foolish refusal to acknowledge the, the the depravity and the difficulty that even Darwin admits is built into human nature. We are selfish, grasping, tribal beings in the world. All you have to do is set people loose and remove laws. Just let the cops take a week off and see what happens. 
That's human nature. Let's be realistic about it. So here's the way we are. Here's the way things ought to be. And most religions in the world say that humans can climb up to the divine level by following a set of codes and commandments. That's Judaism. That's Islam. You follow a diet, follow these rules, and man can step by step move up to God. Christianity is unique and radical in saying, in effect, no. This gap is too big. We're sick in that sense. We cannot climb high enough to get to God's level. We can, we can go up a couple of rungs, but it's ultimately not going to make a difference. Jesus saw that. So Jesus' point, in a sense, is the only way to close the gap is to reverse it. This level has to come down to our level. God has to, in some sense, become man. That's the only way to close this chasm. And Jesus ultimately is, if you will, God's emissary, God's ambassador to the world. And look at what Jesus says. He basically says, yes, we can't jump over the bar. In that sense, we're all guilty. But here's the remedy. What do we have to do to achieve salvation? Only one thing. Admit it. Essentially, if you plead guilty, you are going to get an acquittal. I mean, what could be a gentler, easier counsel than to say whatever you've done, even Hitler, if you have, have true repentance, salvation is assured to you. So what is it in human nature that rebels against a message so easy? In a sense, Christ is essentially saying we're all up on trial, and all we got to say is, I did it, and we can go scot-free. Imagine if our criminal justice system worked that way. Ultimately, Christianity is offering something that remedies a built-in problem in human nature. It's not ultimately just about the Bible. The Bible is a way of interpreting human nature. But I think ultimately what atheism is, is it's a cop-out. It's a refusal to look human nature in the face. It's a refusal to recognize that there is a better world, that we haven't gotten there yet. And in some senses, there are many questions. Why do we have a universe? Why are we here? Where are we going? Science supplies no answer to those questions. Science is in the dark. So to just look to science, science is valuable. I need it for my iPod. I need it for a lot of stuff in the world every time I get on a plane. But ultimately, God answers the deeper questions, and Christianity gives us hope. Thank you very much. Well, I just want to thank you uh, for spending a little bit of time with us. I want to thank Dan and uh, Dinesh both for coming. Uh, I hope they raised uh, some great questions for you. Uh, if you're interested in continuing the conversation, we've prepared a discussion guide uh, that you can get. Uh, you can order, and, uh, and we will either email it to you um, or you can uh, pick it up. Um, and so hopefully that will be something that will help you to continue on in the conversation. Uh, Dinesh is going to walk out of here and walk out uh, to Main Street and do a book signing of his new book. And I just want to remind you, especially for those of you who are our guests, um, that we're going to do this again next year. And uh, we're looking at the possibility of, do, of uh, sort of continuing this conversation and doing the uh, evolution versus creation uh, debate again. So hopefully you'll join us again next year. Thanks for coming. <laughs>